It's a little bit different between families and family. Um, but generally, I mean, when we're, we're talking about love here, so romantic love, erotic love, uh, the Greek word would be eros and the Latin word would be um, amor, and especially eros means really originally desire. So there's a very strong sense on, um, on passion and desire. Very often this love is viewed as something, it's really overwhelming and it's often viewed as really painful. Um, so it's not the sort of warm and fuzzy idea of love that um, we often have. Aristophanes' argument about um, love emerging from the, the once uh, diverse, and, you know, the fact that human beings were once one and became two and, and seek to, to reclaim their original unity. Um, but you go to other sources, you'll find other you know, occasions for where love comes from. So if you think of the story of Dido and Aeneas and Virgil, which we've been reading in Lit Hum, then you see the personification of love in the form of Cupid. Um, and his arrow, so that love there becomes something which comes from outside, um, that you are wounded by, um, and that takes the form of a kind of sickness or a madness or a fever. Love ultimately can be reduced, has to be reduced, to electrochemical activity in the brain, because that's all we have, as, as I taught in the course. So all we have up here is electrochemical activity. So the mere fact that whatever we're feeling, including love, has to be reduced to that, doesn't take any of the excitement or romance out of it. The only one that comes to my mind could be utility, you know, right? Um, when you are when you are with someone, obviously your utility is going to increase. So when you want to decide if you want to be with someone, you have to compare what is the marginal utility of um, of falling in love with someone. But in any case, you know, economics is very rational, and I don't think that love is something so rational. You never know who you are going to fall in love with. Love is having someone who will bring you Nutella when you're having a bad day. And somebody who gives really good hugs. Like oxygen, I guess, it's everywhere. Enjoying being with somebody. Two people who have equal power in a relationship, um, like mutual respect. The recognition within the self of a universal that exists within other people. Two people, yourself being one of those people, are um, like progressing as individuals. Being a sanctuary for another person, when their life gets hard or unbearable, you're there to provide a sort of escape. But really, really, really enjoy, you know, not, don't take that word lightly. Finding the counterpoint of your own soul in someone else's. That is, of seeing of oneself through another. Of being only complete by observing those characteristics that you find in yourself in another. I feel like it's changing every day as I get to know myself and as I get to know Riga. No, love, love is <clears throat> happiness, right? <laughs> love is feeling safe. It's like a, an emotional connection to someone and I can keep being invested in someone. It's the most challenging part of who we are. It makes you happy. It makes you a better person at the end. Christ laid down his life for us, so we should lay down our lives for others. My idea of love has to do a little more with choices. It's being more about making choices that aren't just about yourself, you're also considering another person. I guess being in love in a way is a loss of independence, but it feels so amazing that you don't mind. <laughs> doing what you can to join yourself with something else. Love is actually the history of us being together. It is the every detail, um, the everyday life we have together. Desire to be with one person and you never get tired of each other. I'm a pragmatic scientist, but it's uh, very difficult not to take the hopeless romantic view as well. I guess I'm a hopeless romantic like most of us. There's something exciting about how love can kind of take you to a place that you didn't know you could go or necessarily wanted to go. You care about somebody so much um, that you're completely vulnerable to them. But what makes what makes a relationship work is, you know, if it's mutual, if the other person is completely vulnerable to you as well, you're really vulnerable but really safe at the same time. Your heartbeat increases of the while and let you think that the world is more beautiful.
I feel this very fuzzy sensation, this sort of uh, tickling that I don't know how to explain. It's like a drug, it's like being, it's insatiable, you just need to be with that person. I think it is a combination of being extremely comfortable while still being excited. I'm assuming you feel like butterflies in your stomach, I'm not sure, but yeah, I'll let you know when it happens. <laughs> when you're with that person, everything, just absolutely everything is better just because they're there. Just grocery shopping or going to the bank or mailing a letter. And it's like a feeling of helplessness almost. Like honestly, you can't help but be in love. And it's, it's really beautiful. Love, at least for me, is a feeling you have for someone that uh, involves their happiness, that is, you're not happy unless they're happy, uh, you're sad if they're sad, and you hurt if they hurt. That's the kind of slow burn satisfaction that you that comes from knowing that the person that you are with loves you in a way that is reliable and that has been tested by time and by difficulty, by crisis. Right, that you only get with a person once you've been with them for a long period of time and, and when your relationship has survived um, in the face of difficulty. You, you feel that you are weak, you know? Weak in the sense that uh, maybe you think that you can do everything by your own, but suddenly when you feel in love, you, you, you think, okay, I, I need this person to be with me. I think it just comes naturally. When I was with my girlfriend, it was like, love at first sight. It was just magical. If you think about it, I think falling in love is exactly the right verb. Because we actually fall in love. It's uh, inherently a selfish thing. You uh, receive a reward uh, either in a biochemical sense or in an emotional sense or however you want to think of it. Be over the moon happy to be doing those weird things. Being in love kind of feels Almost like you're in a dream. A lot of times I just like wake up and I'm like, oh yeah, like I'm in a relationship with James and it's great and I can't wait to see him. Like the way that I felt when we first started dating, like very like flushing, like whenever we would talk and like um, just really happy to be involved with somebody in that way and know that they cared about you that much and to care about them that much. Um, I never really went away. There should just be a sort of joy of life, you know? Just everything's a little bit brighter. An obsession, I guess? I always think about the person that I'm really attracted to. You think that it's something that is not going to, to finish, never, but you have this, you know, love is everywhere. Honesty. Tolerance. Communication. Balancing your your desires with the other person's desires. Communication. Honesty. Being transparent. Empathy. Friendship. Sense of self. Communication. 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 Fun. Communication. Having fun. The cliches here are largely true, right? Communication. No surprises. I mean, except the cute ones. Being comfortable with them. Having Christ at the center. A desire to do things together. We accept each other as we are. Being able to trust the other person. You share a secret with each other which you only know. Having things that, are, that the world doesn't know about you but she does and she appreciates that. The recognition aspect, the empathetic point in which you can not just walk in another man's shoes but literally be within their same mindset. There has to be chemistry from the start. There should be some chemistry. We still have chemistry after 37 years or whatever it is. But I think the key to a, a long-term relationship is friendship, is this person should be your best friend. It should be the person you want to spend the most time with. Commitment, you're always there. You know, when you say that, you're going to be there. Yeah, I guess having someone who's really caring and has like the same views as you or is accepting of your views. You have to be aware of like your partner's faults and you have to be intolerant of them because not everyone's going to be perfect. He's become my best friend because I feel like I can tell him anything and I'm not being judged. Independent. You take for granted until you live with somebody and when, once you, you know, you're with them every day, you kind of learn that you do need your own space. The other person understands exactly where you are in life and when that's found, I think the most pure love can, can be realized. 
Um, you know, it's, it's really great to just sort of have like, that companionship um, while going about your day-to-day -day obligations or whatever, um, good days or bad days, it's just good to have someone to sort of ride the ride with you. Having someone to grow with, um, just having someone to be guided by and, you know, someone around while I figure out who I am and what I want. The love comes around from innate nature of people to uh, survive and to extend their genes, but it's also deeper than that, and it, I guess it give, everyone gives their own kind of meaning. I would say, in this modern world, we kind of live lonely. Love is more like an adventure that one puts his all hearts in and search for the response of, of the other. Human beings definitely have a need for, for love. It's kind of pointless to um, live life without someone to share your experiences with. It gives you a purpose to live beyond having success or fame. Just being to connect with people in that level is what makes us human and what keeps us from going crazy. I, I couldn't picture life without it. And to me, it's, it's, what, it, it's, it's what gives life its meaning, you know. Someone who challenges, um, you know, challenge the assumptions and the views that we hold. Someone who will, I don't know, bring in Kansas perspective into an Indian life. I think it's a thing that most people need, right, in the way that we need water or oxygen. Um, I can never remember a time when I didn't um, love a person or feel the love of other people. She sort of trusts me fully and I think that gives me courage and faith to love because I know there's always someone who's waiting and who's responding. I think comfort. Um, we've talked about it fairly often. It's nice to just have someone around whom you don't have to pretend you can be completely honest. Um, we love driving. We love just going for cruises. So just driving around in the countryside and not saying anything but just enjoying the moment together. Taco Sundays, that is something I love. We make tacos and watch TV shows every Sunday. I definitely am most grateful for what she's done for me uh, on an emotional and, and personal level. I, I came out of the Marine Corps very cold, callous. I wasn't really doing much and uh, I, you know I met her and she was uh, what, your last, her last year getting her undergrad at USC and she kind of convinced me to to go to, to go to school and, and start my um, academic career and <laughs> it's stupid and it's kind of cliche but she's taught me how to love. You make me feel secure, I guess. <laughs> it makes it fun to come home to, to hang out. Last winter retreat, so a long time before we started dating, before we were even thinking that that would be like something that would happen, um, we were we went hiking, Val and. I and another friend. And we got back to the cabin. Um, we were actually worshiping together. He was playing yeah, the guitar right. and singing, right. and I was singing along with him. And yeah, I, I felt like we really connected by singing together. <laughs> this smile. Mm. She's a copycat, you know? I feel that I'd be much more happier with someone who's interested in something that I'm interested in and then we can have like good discussions on something and come up with something new or like do something fun or cool together. So it's an intellectual union of service and not only like the romantic, the physical union. I can't imagine ever being with, being in love with in a really, you know, mutual and satisfying way with a person who thought that the sort of intellectual labour that I do as a, as a professor um, as a reader, as a writer, is unimportant and wasn't interested in ideas. But my wife is not a professor and she doesn't think about the world in the same way that I do. She's very, very, I mean, she's intensely smart, um, but it's a different sort of intelligence um, and she's interested by different sorts of things as I am. Um, 
and that's important to me too. What's nice about our intellectual interests is that they overlap but they're not identical. So when she comes home, she can tell me about an operation she did and I can find it interesting, why it's good for a marriage or certainly our marriage. One side is the common interest, but the other side is you're not doing exactly the same thing in the day. So when you come home and you're exhausted, you know, when you want to complain or have somebody empathize with what you've done, you aren't tapping into the problems that they've experienced in the day. Love probably the same. The approaches are different. Like in India, love is not something you confess. At least I haven't. Like, for example, my parents got uh, where like their marriage was arranged, so they never meet met each other before. Like before they got married. So, but then they love each other. So, but like human feelings are the same everywhere. Um, we grew up 8,000 miles apart in you know very different cultures, and yet we have the same sense of humor. I think we're both very curious people. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, being from such drastically different places <laughs> was, was one of the things that drew us to each other, I think. I, I mean, I'd hate to date someone who was the exact same as me. So. Yeah. <laughs> There's plenty of challenges. I think, um, speaking different languages, there was a lot of... Um, Communication area? Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe we look differently at traditions and stuff? I think traditions and holidays are a big one. Uh, we look at them a lot differently. Something that you have to work on in a relationship. Oh, in a good way too. So she celebrates Thanksgiving, I celebrate 17th of May. and We get to, we get to enjoy new holidays that we normally wouldn't get to. For me, I just really enjoy watching James trying to learn Spanish. It's great. <laughs> He's getting really good, his pronunciation is really improving. You know, in Hispanic culture, relationships are um, treated differently and I actually went to Uruguay for a month um, this winter break and it just reminded me how people back in Uruguay and my cousins who are all back there, um, at age 20 they're thinking about marriage in a way that is not thought of in the U.S. But I think we've been doing well in just communicating, communicating to each other. Christ unites us all um, regardless of what our backgrounds are. Uh, currently my girlfriend is at Yale so we cannot meet each other on a very frequently, frequent basis and uh, once you cannot communicate with the other person uh, face to face, there's some issue going on because you cannot express yourself fully. The biggest challenge for a long distance relationship is not being physically there with a person. So you can talk as long as you want to that person, and that's really nice. But just the moment where you can actually just be in contact is just infinitely better just because you actually have their presence and you sense that they're there. So being away from that for so long can get to be really painful and you just start to like yearn for that person but it makes it a hundred times more rewarding when you're actually with them so you learn to appreciate each other a lot more. Other than wear condoms, um, which is really important, um, right, there's two dangers. One is just is, is treating love and sex especially too lightly. Um, and, and seeing it as, you know, a sport. Um, and that, you know, it's fun, but that can have the, you know, that can, that can be dangerous. It can be dangerous to yourself, it can be dangerous to other people. It's easy for people to get hurt. Um, and it's easy to hurt yourself without even realizing it. Um, and to, you know, and, 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 and it's easy to have an attitude towards these things that stops yourself from feeling as intensely or as interestingly as you might. Um, but the other danger is that I think sometimes I see people charge into versions of, you know, quote unquote adult relationships far too quickly. I mean that they start to couple up, um, move in with one another, plan their future, you know, before they've barely known one another. When you first meet somebody, uh, there's often this a wonderful, you know, rush of emotion and feelings that some people call love, it's not love, it's just a little piece of love, right? And what most people do is they sort of enjoy it the way they might enjoy a drug or a drink or something like that. And then that part leaves, that part 
decreases a little bit, and they're still left asking themselves, do I want, is, am I serious about this or not? That's the wrong way to go about it. If you have this wonderful feeling for somebody, that's the time to build a foundation for a relationship. That's the time to make believe it's going to be forever. That's the time where you can talk to each other and say things you wouldn't be able to say five, a, a couple of years later. So you assume it's forever, and sometimes it becomes forever. And that's what happened to me. But he has one song that says, a new love is like a newborn baby. So the metaphor is a baby for love. And if you develop, if you take care of the baby and nurture it, it grows into a strong thing. Grown men living in one really long building in bunk beds. So you get off work and you're, you're basically still at work, you live at work, so then you know your, your squad leader, the guy in charge of you is, is 10 feet away, so any time when you're off work you could be getting yelled at. The way the military is set up is if you get married you're given a housing allowance or you're giving base housing, so it's extremely beneficial to get married to get out of that situation, and so people get married just to get out of the barracks, to get out of the squad base. They don't spend enough time uh, making sure that they want to be with that person. The divorce rate in the Marine Corps is horrendously high. I would say for every 20 people I've met in the Marine Corps, probably 15 of them ended up getting married, and all 15 of them got divorced. Um, deployments last seven months, and you know, people, wives cheat on husbands constantly. It, it's a uh, it's a it's a horrible excuse for uh, for love in that in that area, and that's you know it was four years of my life, and I and I witnessed that every day, so I came away very detached, and I mean you know just poor thing she had to when we started dating I was very void of emotion I I really didn't um, I didn't believe in love I didn't believe in any of those things, and it, and it took me a while uh, to finally actually feel and experience love to realize that it was there. She went to USC when I was in the Marine Corps. I was stationed at Camp Pendleton, Southern California, and USC is in LA, and uh, we met in LA. When I got accepted to Columbia, I, uh, I originally planned to move by myself, and then she, it had always been her dream to live in New York, and she had already came from the other side of the world, Norway. So uh, she applied to NYU and got into NYU, and it worked out great. We've been together for three years, so it's, it's not like, um, a joke, yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty serious. I guess our faith gives us a basis for what ultimate love is and that God is love and that all love that we can have towards others starts with the love that He has for us and our love just emanates as part of being grateful for the mercy that He's shown for us. When you're in a relationship, I guess it manifests by you know, trying to remember to put God in the center of the relationship and knowing that if the two people have their lives centered on God, that the relationship will glorify Him. When it comes to like specifically loving James, and I would say that um, it's loving people despite their shortcomings, but mostly despite your own shortcomings. The Bible says that God uh, created us male and female in his image, I think it in some way does mean that the way that we relate to each other in love um, is a representation of the love um, within the Trinity. Love is um, an important source of joy in our lives. You know, Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another, that your joy may be full. Queer people do love in lots of different ways, <laughs> um, some similar to heterosexual couples, some not. It seems like we play with it a bit more. It seems to be like there's like a trend for us to like not have like a set script for ourselves. There aren't as many expected roles for you, so you're a bit freer to like carve out what feels right for you in that relationship in terms of the dynamic between two people or multiple people. It seems to be in the queer community there are like like many like alternative ways of being in a relationship with someone. Like people are in relationships with multiple people, they're in relationships with like same gender, different gender, uh, all types of gender expression. 
I would assume that like feelings are the same. Like everybody has feelings. I promised I'd never sing of love. Public, some places are like less accepting of like uh, displays of affection between people of the same sex. It can be really hard for people to come out to their families and have their families support their relationship. Not wanting to tell people is definitely like hard. You know, if you if you are really into someone and you love that person, it's like. It doesn't feel good for that person to not be willing to share that with others that are important to them. I, I planned a scavenger hunt for her sort of throughout Midtown just as a, um, a way to sort of show her that I wanted to you know, move things to like a romantic level, I guess. We had been friends. So what I did was um, I just went around with little notes to um, a bunch of like vendors and places around Midtown. I think I had a nuts for nuts guy named, named Juan, very nice guy, um, at Columbus Circle, and I just went up to him and said, uh, "All right, I mean, I explained my situation. I said I'm planning a scavenger hunt for a girl. Um, so if um, an Indian girl with big hair comes by in a couple hours, can you give her this note?" Um, and then I went to a Starbucks uh, in Times Square, and they actually refused to hold the note for me, even after I explained it to everyone. So I sort of had to circumvent them and hide it underneath. Um, and then the last note I gave the security guard at uh, Condé Nast, which was where Rachel was interning at the, at the time. So she finished her internship, the security guard stopped her, gave her a note, um, then she went to the Starbucks, then she went to the Nuts for Nuts. For nuts. Um, and originally my plan was to have food from Whole Foods in the park, in Central Park, to have a little picnic, but unfortunately it was raining that day, so um, we just had a little informal picnic inside of the Whole Foods cafeteria. <laughs> I felt like I was in a movie. <laughs> it was great. Oh. She's texting me the entire time. Yeah. She's finding clue, 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 and it's, it's pretty cute. And it's exactly the kind of thing that I love. Surprises, cute things. <laughs> Well, I guess the one I, I, I think is the most effective is um, equality between the sexes or like equal opportunity um, for all genders and sexes. Delilah, what's it like in New York City? I'm a thousand miles away. For some theorists of like the second wave of feminism during like the 60s and 70s, um, they felt that you shouldn't like build relationships with men because like you were being like you were being imposed into heterosexuality by the patriarchy and that like if you were if you were like free to choose without patriarchy then you would probably form relationships with women. And I think a lot of other um, people in our generation, which is the third wave of feminism, think that um, love and sex, like feminism thinks that the that um, the personal is political, but for me there are some things that are off limits and that I'm not comfortable um, policing for anybody else. I think that that comes up in a lot of the policy that feminists talk about, especially with um, like gay marriage and like queer relationships and like abortion, that it's it's your right to choose and that other people shouldn't be involved in that. Many third wave feminism, um, feminists emphasize that it's women's right to choose the way that they conduct their personal relationships. We'll have the life. I've been in the same relationship since I was 15. Oh. <laughs> and now I'm 20. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, what, where I was coming into my relationship and where I am now are different, but we grew together. I'm very feministy, but I'm also very traditionally feminist. <laughs> So it's a it's like a it's a weird like ironic balance that me and my friends joke about all the time because like I like to cook and like I'm I will clean up after my boyfriend because it annoys me when he's messy. I'm not worried about keeping my own individuality in my relationship. Partly I guess because I'm growing up with my boyfriend, you know, like we were teenagers and now we're adults. So it's it's being whole together rather than being whole like by myself. It's really about making the choices that are right for you. Um, like I, I expect that um, my feminist friend will not question how I go about my relationship, even if sometimes it seems like um, me and my boyfriend are following traditional gender roles. Especially because my boyfriend is um, a, in computer science at MIT. So like, and I told, like I told you earlier, I'm an English and woman's gender studies major. So chances are his paycheck is going to be bigger than mine. Like, let's be real. <laughs>
and um, you know, if we move in together, um, or like where we go after college, might really be dependent on where he gets a job because he's gonna make more money than I am. Um, and you know, that's that's really uncomfortable from a feminist perspective, but it's also just the reality of my relationship, and I know that I'm making choices that are important to my life, and I wouldn't impose them on anybody else or expect anybody else anybody else's opinion about it to matter. Love me tender, love me sweet, never let me go. You have made my life complete, and Love me tender, love me true, all my dreams fulfill. For my darling, I love you, and I always will. Love me tender. Love me long, take me to your heart. For it's there that I belong, and 